and the Huskers are going to go to 13 and 3 on the year and to 3 and 2 in the conference. And you hear the Go Big Red chant. Get this ball in bounds. Let this, let this crowd storm the floor, baby. Gillis into Braden Smith. Five, four, three, two, one. And for the first time in 41 years, Nebraska knocks off the top-ranked team in the country, and they are storming the floor. They are storming yeah, the floor. They are storming the floor. Love it. Love Sign it. your name, Fred Hoiberg. There's your signature win. They're partying here in Lincoln, Nebraska. <laughs> what madness. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Scarlet Shoe Round podcast. Obviously, because this is a little bit of a special occasion, we altered our intro music. I uh, wanted to give you the Kent Pavelka and Jake Muleheisen natural call of pure emotion and joy. Felt it was appropriate. So Nebraska comes in and destroys Purdue. I you know I turned to my buddy, uh, Mike, right, you know, around halftime, is like, what if we mess around and win by 15? And here we are, Mike, 16 point win. Yeah, no, uh, you were you were pretty pretty on it. What an incredible incredible game! I know the last 24 hours for all Nebraska basketball fans out there has probably been the best since I don't know, no sit Sunday in 2014. Like it's been it's been a long decade. So to get one finally feels real real good, like a good neck crack almost. You know, like, <laughs> you really needed it. And I want to introduce, we have a special guest today with us, Mr. Dirk Shatlin. Dirk, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, boys. There's nothing uh, There's nothing in Nebraska sports quite like an NCAA tournament uh, push in February and March. Uh, and it sure looks like it's headed that direction. This is going to be a really, really fun 60 days. Yes, it is. So let's kind of get into the breakdown of this one a little bit. A lot of talk about, hopefully we can keep it within uh, you know, 15 minutes relatively. This episode might run a little long because there's a lot to talk about. 15 but... minutes? <laughs> well, we got, we, we, we got a lot of stuff to cover, a lot of stuff to cover here. So we got to be efficient. We got to be efficient. Uh, so Tominaga, uh, stat line of 19, 1, and 4, goes 5 of 12 from the field, 5 of 9 from 3. He did Tominaga things and he made shots that looked impossible. Mike, he's just doing what we're used to seeing, really. Yeah, I think I, I'd said in the previous um, episode, you know, I don't know if I want to declare he's back after a couple good games, but it is sure trending to look that way. I mean, it's I, the, the people in the Twitter the Twitter reply saying he needs to get more shots after every game. I think there might be on to something because he just he was on fire right now. Yeah, five from nine from three. That's it's just incredible. And when he's got it going, it just makes everybody else so much better. And Dirk, you've watched and covered Nebraska basketball for a long time. Do you ever remember having a shooter or a player like this that had this kind of emotion and intensity and passion for the game? No, I mean, they've had some good shooters. I mean, Piakowski, Kerry Cohorn. Uh, I mean, there's been some guys who could really shoot it. But but just that there is an element of showmanship um, that, that Kese brings that I think especially at home is uh, – is is a really powerful force. I mean, when he gets it going, the crowd lights up. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I don't think they they win yesterday without you know his his flame throwing and his emotion. I mean, he he really kind of lit the building up. I thought, uh, but you know, what a what a performance across the board. I mean, uh, what what impresses me so much about Nebraska right now is it feel it doesn't feel fluky at all. Uh, it feels like they have answers. You know, it's like if, if Tominaga goes quiet for a while, you know, they've got they've got Wilcher behind him. They've got, you know, Mast and Alec. They've got, you know, uh, Bryce and they've got Lawrence. I mean, there's just – they've got Hoiberg to come in and, and give them a spark. I mean, there's just lots of different ways that they can, that they can go on a little six-point run. Uh, and, and that's what good teams do. I mean, even Nebraska's good teams in the past – uh, over the past decade, it felt like they were, uh, the, you know, a pretty small margin for error. Uh, not many answers if things kind of broke down. And and this team just feels a little bit more versatile, capable of winning in more different ways. 
Yeah, and you bring up the fact that it doesn't feel fluky. If we look back at some of the bigger wins we've had, you know, over the short little span of Fred Hoiberg, you know, looking back at last year, we played Creighton, right? And and obviously not trying to take anything away from that win, but when you look at the actual details of it, Creighton couldn't hit the side of a barn. And they mentioned that on the 24-7 podcast, which so I must shout them out because it got brought up. But, you know, this was not a fluke. Purdue played a great game. They shot 42% from the field, so maybe not as good as they'd have liked. 39% from three, which is, you know, plenty good enough to win a lot of games. 73% from the free throw line. You know, they had quite a few turnovers, but they had 17 assists. Mike, this was a legitimate result. Purdue did not play a bad game. Oh, yeah, no, it's just when you shoot 61% from three on your own side, it's it makes it a lot easier to win. We we kind of did to Purdue what we saw Wisconsin do to the Huskers. It just seemed like everything was going in. Um, seemed like we always had an answer, even when they'd cut it back, especially in the second half. They went on a couple runs. I think they made eight of their first nine shots to start the second half, and um, I just want to shout out the resiliency, resiliency of this team. You know, we've seen them the whole season. They don't fight. They don't or they don't give up. They just fight the whole time. They're not moping around. They don't get too high, too low. Um, they just stay steady and they answer. And uh, shout out to, you know, CJ Wilcher coming in off the bench. Talk about a flamethrower. I mean, the dude's shooting lights out recently. It's been insane. So um, on that half, I do want to say shout out to Josiah Alec with his one for one three. Uh, when Purdue cut it to one, that might have been the biggest three of the game out of all the threes we made, and it came from maybe the most unlikely source. But, hey, every little bit counts. So um, just very it, impressive it, for me. I was really, really impressed. You know, I, I sent my, my – so just big picture here, uh, full confession. I I go to my wife last night at 645, and I'm like, I have a ticket to this game. Should I go down? And she's like, well, you know, you're kind of trying to read your spouse a little bit. And she's like, well, you know, yeah, I think you could. And, you know, it'd be okay. And I'm kind of trying to read her face like this, you know, is is this one that I have permission to go to? She gave me permission, but it's cold. And like, I'm like, ah, geez, I don't know. I don't think Nebraska is going to win. So I did anyway, didn't end up going. And I, I was kicking myself uh, in that last three minutes before halftime when Nebraska goes on the big run. And then the first few minutes of the second half, I'm like, okay, I made a good decision. Uh, Purdue's going to come back and win this game easily. I, I'm, I'm saying all that because what impressed me so much about Nebraska last night is, is Purdue goes on the big run to start the second half. I mean, a pretty easy run, you know, to get that thing back to what one point, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's 51 50. And then Nebraska just, you know, just, just grabs the, you know, grabs the game back. Uh, they basically just wrestled it away from Purdue uh, in that little stretch, you know, 13, 12 minutes to go in the, in the second half. And Hoiberg does his thing and Wilcher does his thing. And, you know, from there, it wasn't – the game was never really in doubt. I, I was so impressed by Nebraska uh, responding to that Purdue run in the first five minutes of the second half. And I think a lot of people both in the gym and watching on TV really felt it was just kind of that aura. It's like, okay, Purdue's starting to get their thing going. They're probably going to run away with this. They're getting hot. We know that they're a good three-point shooting team. Edie's going to get his, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, Tominaga and, and C.J. Wilcher, Mike mentioned Wilcher, goes four or five from the field, hits three of his four three-pointers, and I think he hit three consecutive ones kind of right in that region of the early second half. He's playing some of the best basketball of his career, guys. He's shooting 61% from behind the arc since the North Dakota game. I mean, that's unheard of. And uh, Hoiberg was very complimentary of Tominaga and Wilcher in his post-game press conference. I think this goes both ways. I think they feed off him, and, and certainly he feeds off them. And, you know, it just uh, some of those shots he made <laughs> were just, they were crazy. And, you know, it's, it's over the last few years, what, you, what you've learned with K-State is you live with some of those. And it certainly paid off tonight with, with him knocking down those shots. But, you know, again, C.J., you know, when Casey was on the bench, hit hit some huge ones as well. And, you know, CJ's playing with so much confidence right now. I just love to see it. And those guys, I thought, played good minutes together out there as well. But, you know, just again, overall, from start to finish, just so proud of the guys. So, Dirk, CJ Wiltshire has been a part of this team for at least three years now. I don't know his clock off the top of my head. I know he's a junior eligibility-wise. What? How big of an X factor is he going into every every game, and how important is is his role in securing obviously the the first Nebraska NCAA tournament bid in over a decade? Well, uh, he he spaces the floor. I mean, he's so much better this year. I think his uh, I think his shot selection has been better. 
Uh, I just think he he understands his role a little bit, but you know a little bit better. You know, he's played 19 minutes last night. Like that's not that's not starter minutes, but he comes in and and uh, he makes good decisions. He takes good shots. You know, he only took five shots last night, but he hit three big ones in the second half. Like you said, hits all five of his free throws. I mean, 16 points in 19 minutes. That's pretty much what you're looking for from from a sixth man. So, uh, you know, and and we could go down the roster about all the guys that made contributions. And again, that's what I like about Nebraska right now. You know, I went through the list earlier. I didn't even mention Jawan Gary. I mean, that's that's probably the toughest guy on your on your you know whole rotation. But but honestly, I don't want to go too much farther without highlighting this guy. You know, Rick Mast, I thought, was the key to the game. Even bigger than Tominaga, even bigger than Wilcher, because he made Edie, first of all, work really, really hard to get touches. And then he he challenges Edie on the other end and, and puts Edie in, in situations that, that the big guy's not comfortable in. Uh, I think Mast is an absolute recruiting steal. Uh, I, I don't... I don't know how Nebraska got lucky enough to have this guy fall into their lap, but uh, but he is such a key part of this thing. When Nebraska lost Derek Walker, I thought they were really stuck, you know. Uh, and Mast has come in and, and played a similar role with with you know equal, if not better, toughness. If if Nebraska can stay healthy, they've got a roster that that sure, surely looks like an NCAA tournament roster. Um, and, and again, just so many different ways to win, which is what I love about this team. And Mast has a stat line of 18, four and three going eight of 17 from the field hits two of his five, three point attempts. And as you mentioned, Dirk, he absolutely dominated Zach Eady. He was uncomfortable the entire first half only resulting, I believe in two points, maybe two rebounds and two fouls or something along those lines. And Mast's range from three really helped open up the paint on cuts. How big of a key do you think that was to our offensive game plan, Mike? Oh, huge. I know. <clears throat> Especially in the first half, CJ got a backdoor a couple times, and when when the defense has to you know keep that backdoor cut in the back of their mind, it makes getting open for three, which is what we really want CJ and Casey to be doing, it makes it so much easier. If if the defense has to worry about uh, a big passing uh, from you know the high post, the top of the key, like like Mass has shown that he's able to do, um, which you know uh, Dirk brought up Derek Walker, it's very reminiscent of what he was able to do last year. But Rink is definitely a bit more of a threat to actually shoot the ball from three, too. You know, you mentioned two for five. If your big guy's shooting 40% from three, that's a pretty good clip. So uh, what he brings is just huge. I, I, obviously, that's on the offensive end. On the defensive end, though, yeah, he's he was front needy all night. He was fighting. You know, in the first half, it was a clinic. If, if you're ever an undersized big, just watch that first half from Mast and how he approached defending Edie because – he was using his body, his lower body a lot and kind of just bullying him, trying to get him off his place. He kept his hands up the whole time. You know, he wasn't grabbing, wasn't hooking or anything, just using his strength to, to fight for position. And it was a great job. Um, like you said earlier, Blake, you know, the, his ability to defend without fouling has just been a revelation for this team. It's so nice to have a big, you can rely on that. He does a good job protecting the, the cup too, but to rely on him and not have him in foul trouble when, you know, that's been a worry the last couple of games across our team. But it seems like every game he comes in, he gives good minutes. You never have to pull him with two fouls, and he just does everything right, honestly. So Nebraska has a lot of offensive threats, obviously plays a pretty tight brand of defense when they they choose to. We've had some some ifs and nays here and there, but Matt Painter was also very complimentary of the team that Fred Hoiberg has put together this year. You know, we, we, we had to do a better job defensively, um, but to their credit, their shot makers, made, they made some tough ones. Um, we had some breakdowns, and they capitalized on them. And then other times when we did some good things, I thought, uh, you know, Wilcher and Tominagi made some really, really tough threes. And, you know, Mast is a, is a good player. He, I thought he really played well. But I just, um, I like their team. I like how hard they play. They're, they're together. They can, they can hurt you in different ways. I like their system. I like the shit they run. Um, they cut, they move. It's real basketball. And, uh, you know, it's, it, was, it was tough for us to guard. And hearing that kind of compliment, Dirk, from, you know, as, as an accomplished of, an, of a coach as Matt Painter has been over the past decade plus, really speaks to the volumes of what a lot of Nebraska fans haven't seen at PBA in a long time. This is how it was supposed to be from the start with Fred Hoiberg. I mean, isn't it crazy? Like, this is, uh, this is precisely what Nebraska fans thought they were getting uh, you know, five years ago when Fred showed up and, uh, it, it's been a, a pretty dreadful era. Uh, I think Nebraska has, 
has largely wasted the last decade. Um, you know, a, a new practice facility, a, a new arena, a new conference, and they've gotten so little out of it that it's been infuriating. Uh, but, but gosh, what a payoff last night was. And I, I think, you know, the, to me today was, was just sort of like a, was kind of a broader celebration of, of the persistence of the fan base and the program. Um, guys like you that have weathered a lot of bad nights. Uh, you know, I, I must have got videos and photos of the court storm from, you know, half a dozen people on my phone this morning that were there. And, you know, it just, it, it, it really had a, a, a sense of satisfaction uh, that you just don't get in, in too many sporting events. And, and I, I would love to hear your guys' perspective on just kind of the emotion of the whole thing. Yeah, it's just it. You know, obviously, I was I was in the arena. Mike, unfortunately, was not. But when I tell you, there are very few occasions with Nebraska basketball that you'll cry. A lot of the times, they're due to you know true sadness and depression as opposed to joy. But yesterday was one of the nights where I cried over a victory, and and my, the people that I was sitting next to would attest would attest to this. With two minutes left, and you knew it was over, and the time was just counting down, you would turn around to the guy right next to you. You don't even know his name, and you're hugging him. You could just feel <laughs> the emotion running rampant through the building, and it, there's just something to be said for how much that that this meant to the fan base, Mike. Yeah, and let's not forget, students are still on winter break, so that there was a vast majority of students were not there. That was farmers and people that work for Huddle and just a grown grown adults were out there storming the court. Like Dirk said, that's just, you know, a, a shout out to the, the entire fan base that just been waiting for something like this. Um, the palpable energy, you know, I, obviously I wasn't there, but being, yeah, seeing all the videos, you know, I saw Matt rule even joined in on it with his daughter, which was just incredible, you know, um, just crazy. It's, it's, it's insane to see the energy. Um, I've, I've always said it'd be great to be a basketball school. Don't get me wrong. I'd love to be a football school, quote unquote football school, but just the energy when you're in that arena and, and you have a big win like that. So intimate, so closed in. I just, I don't think there's a whole lot like it. You know, I, I know we stormed the court back when we were in school, Blake, I can't remember. Maybe that was when we beat Michigan, Michigan, when they had, um, Wagner and all that Wagner. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's been a long time for, for this fan base and it's so, so good. I was texting my family. I said, you know, I think this might be the, the greatest sporting win of my life. Just it's, it's incredible after the last decade we've had, like Dirk said, just wasting away kind of to finally get something to go our way and, and look legitimate. And we look like we belong this year. Guys. I always say that in the, the Kansas city Royals uh, drove home this point for me uh, when they won the world series and, and sort of, you know, shocked the world, so to speak. But I, I I've, often say that there's nothing more important or more fun. There's nothing more fun in sports than, than a, a program or a franchise that surprises you. Uh, you can win a championship, but it's not as much fun as a team that's better than you think they're going to be. Uh, and this, this Nebraska team is exactly that. And the coolest part is, like I said earlier, I mean, you, you guys, this is like a 65, 70 day, you know, roller coaster thrill ride now. I mean, there's going to be huge ups, huge downs. Uh, I would imagine this thing goes all the way to Selection Sunday, uh, where where Nebraska is. You know, guys like you are are sweating through every minute of it. But this is this is what you sign up for. I mean, this is exactly the fun of being a sports fan. And guys, we would be remiss. You mentioned, you know, the highs and lows and, and being better than we thought they would. Perfect segue into Bryce Williams, guys. He has a stat line of 9, 11, and 9, 2 of 6 from the field. Hits his only uh, three-point attempt. Nearly has a triple-double on what we, you know, he had set himself a bum ankle that almost caused him to not even play, Mike. Yeah, for me, I think he was my player of the game. Um, it's it's incredible what adrenaline and medicine can do. Yeah, on a bum ankle to come out and and have the type of night he did. You 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 gave a stat line. Then he also had two steals and two blocks. And I don't know the last time I saw Zach Eady get blocked from behind, but I'll tell you, I jumped up off the couch and yelled when Bryce Williams blocked him from behind. I I scared the dog and I scared the girlfriend, which um, I hope they forgive me, but. It was it, it got me going. I can't imagine what it was like in the arena. So for me, yeah, player of the game, he looks really comfortable kind of being our lead guard when Jamarcus isn't in the game. You know, nine assists. I wasn't expecting it, but he looks good kind of commanding the offense. 
Um, I think maybe that's something we, we look at going forward, but just an incredible game with, with, you know, one and a half ankles play. And it's, it's really, really amazing. And Dirk, what's really surprising about this team's makeup uh, specifically to this roster is the fact that we've had, you know, a couple big transfers in Bryce Williams and Mast and, you know, some lesser ones in Alec and Boogie, but it's amazing how fast that this team has, has gelled and how smooth they sometimes look on offense. Totally agree. Uh, that, that was not something that I expected. Uh, I thought Nebraska would be a little bit clunky offensively, you know, with, with guys that didn't have a lot of high major experience, especially, uh, sometimes there's a big jump athletically between the mid major level and the high major level. And, uh, and, and sometimes, you know, offense is where you really notice that, uh, a team that just can't get to the basket like they did, or, uh, can't get separation like they did. And, and they've really done a nice job, you know, finding roles and they play well together. Um, I think some of that is, is sort of the difference in, in the players, you know, uh, it's, it's a lot of parts that fit together rather than a bunch of parts that overlap. Uh, I also think it's just a testament to the experience and, and sort of the, um, you know, the, the, the winning nature of these guys where I think they're motivated by the right things. Uh, I think some of that is being old and, and veteran. I think some of it is, is just in their character. So they seem to be really motivated by the right things and doing things the right way. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's, that's how you win games like last night. A win like last night takes so much, not only energy and skill, but it takes so much discipline uh, and I thought Nebraska was was so disciplined on on really both ends of the floor all night. And Bryce Williams, obviously being kind of the the temperament that he has, kind of sets that tone. I think for a lot of this team, uh, he also set some interesting expectations in his post game press conference. Yeah, we know we're not preparing every day just to beat Purdue, competing for a national championship. Um, well, first the Big Ten championship and then the national championship. <clears throat> um, celebrate tonight, like CJ said. Um, but like, never get too high, never get too low. Just yep. keep going, keep moving, keep moving forward. That's but that big that was a big win. But that's not all we're here to do. So obviously, some very exciting stuff there from Bryce Williams, and it kind of I think gives you a mentality into the, or gives you a peek into the mentality that Fred Hoiberg is trying to instill into this team, Mike. Yeah, I, I, I've said it a lot. Just you know, one game at a time. It's tough to have. You know, I think we play you know in two days now, so three days to to get over this win. And I think I saw the the video of Coach Hoiberg in the locker room afterwards saying, you know, enjoy it tonight, but when we come in the gym tomorrow, we got to put it behind us and move on to Iowa. So that's tough to do emotionally, but yeah, I, I think Coach is just saying one game at a time. We got high aspirations, high goals. Um, obviously, this is a big step along the way to to you know make the tourney, kind of say we're here, but. You hear Bryce talking about championships. I think uh, the city of Lincoln might burn if we came home with a championship. So uh, it's it's exciting to hear. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but yeah, one game at a time on to Iowa. Uh, Going to enjoy this one, though. So we've talked a lot about, you know, what we took away from this game. The fans had a lot to share on our Twitter page as well. So let's get into that. So Husker fans, let's hear from you. Okay, everybody. So obviously, like I said, we had a ton of interaction on our tweet, had a lot of engagements, a lot of things to get through. I'm going to try to fire through as many as I can, as efficiently as I can. Uh, starting off with uh, Huskin Fanatic says, the country now has a new Cinderella team to bet on going into March Madness. After this win and seeing our potential, there's no reason not to think we can make a run. We are on our way to a historic season and we have the whole nation's attention now. And Coach T says, this is a momentum swing. We've waited years. This was years in the making and just legitimized what we had all hoped and waited to happen. Finally, go Big Red. So, Dirk, I want to throw this one to you. What would you say are realistic expectations, and, and should we temper ourselves a little bit after this win, or should we just take it and run? Well, take it and run because irrational is, is you know, that's the fun part of this. Um, I, I think the Big Ten is down. I think Nebraska is, you know, very capable of being a top four, top five team in the Big Ten, which would – which would uh, comfortably get them in the in the NCAA tournament, uh, but you know, I don't think this is going to be easy. And you know, going to Iowa on Friday night is a really good test for how a team that's not used to winning big games like that responds. How do you how do you kind of keep your cool? Um, and you know, even going to Rutgers after that, I mean, those Nebraska needs one of those too. 
you know, you got to split those two, I think. And then, then you can, uh, you can start thinking long term. but, uh, win one of the next two. I, I still think 22 is kind of the magic number. I think that gets you in the tournament. Uh, that includes the big 10 tournament, you know, win, win nine more games. Uh, and I think you're, I think you're dancing. Um, and I, like I said, the league is down. I think that's very doable this year. Husker power says dream come true. I've been waiting for this moment for so long. Storming the court was my top Husker moment. And Jake Oldenheist says biggest feeling of vindication in my life as a Husker hoops fan, all the groin kicks and bad calls in big conference games over the years. That was the best we've played in a long time. Incredible, incredible game plan by coach and the execution by mass Gary Alec to frustrate uh, Zach Eady. And I will say to this point, Mike, Zach Eady did not look comfortable again in the first half, but more so the entirety of the game. Mast said in his post-game press conference that he even threw a fist pump within the first four minutes because Eady was complaining to the refs uh, before the first media timeout. So what a job by Coach Hoiberg, and what a fantastic game plan that they put together for this one. Great job by the staff. Yeah, absolutely. Great job by the staff to get together. And honestly, it seemed like we were just straight up double teaming him the whole time. Like, didn't even guard their four. We just, whoever, you know, whether it was – uh, Alec or, or Gary, uh, just helping constantly on it. I, we were just daring their, their power forwards, their fours, their other forwards, their other bikes to, to do something with the ball. And they weren't able to, and it was just a, you know, that's, that's how it goes. Sometimes, uh, is a great defensive game plan. They, they didn't shoot the ball kind of, you know, as you mentioned, 42% from the field, isn't exactly what they would hope for. And I think it's maybe their second lowest on the year. So, just goes to show um, the, the the quality of the coaching, the game plan, and yeah, like like the tweet said, you know, shout out to the guys for for implementing it and, and following, you know, what the coaches said and then executing it to the highest degree. Honestly, yeah, as you mentioned, Edie wasn't comfortable all night. Uh, he could tell he was frustrated. Obviously, he's going to get his still had 15 points, but this is a guy that's averaging a double double, uh, and he ended up with 15 and seven. So. I'd say that's a pretty good job on the uh, reigning national player of the year and probably leading candidate to, to repeat. Nebraska Cubby says, how am I supposed to sleep tonight? Big 10 Gabriel says, bet we go undefeated through 2037. And Tanner Turek says, this was such a great game. Team came out with more intensity than Wisconsin. Offense flowed very well. The unsung hero was Sam Hoiberg. He made so many little plays defensively. And Dirk, I want to throw this one to you. Have, I mean, what an incredible – it reminds me a little bit of like a Benny Parker type, a, a defensive guy that's going to sneak you some steals, get you a ton of energy. How big of, a, of an importance is Sam Hoiberg to, to make this whole thing work? Oh, he's, he's hugely important. And I think, you know, Nebraska has um, – you know, it, it's a great story for a lot of reasons. I mean, the coach's son and all that. He was not – he was not one of the 10 best players in the state of Nebraska when he came out of high school. I mean, so much of his development, uh, I think has has happened since he got to the university, which is cool too. Um, but you know, he really, I mean, it's, again, it's not fluky. He's a really good athlete. He's very instinctive. Uh, and I, he plays a great role. I mean, you just look at how these pieces fit together. And, and I think that's one of the coolest parts of this team is it's like, you know, it's it's sort of like if you're putting together a cast of characters for a for a sitcom or something like that, and you're trying to find people with different characteristics and different strengths. Uh, Nebraska's got that. I mean, they've got uh, you know whether they fell into it or they did it deliberately. You know, they've pretty much got eight guys that that all do something a little bit different, uh, and and they do it with humility too, which I think is important. And Hoiberg, I think, is is one of the key parts of that. Whizbang Hoop says, uh, "Don't have much to say. Not that all that, not that all that eventful. Dot dot dot. Let's effing go. Best environment since No Sit Sunday." Um, Andrew Hansen says, "The defensive game plan was perfect and well executed. Tomonaga is insane. Mass took Zach Eady to lunch. Unbelievable win. That was my first ever court storm, and it was incredible to experience." And David at Lincoln says, "I feel awesome for Fred. He always knew how to coach offense, but finally started to build teams with grit as well as a staff that is buying into that culture of grit and toughness. How could you not want to run through a wall?" for a guy like Nate L late lenser and guys, Mike, I'll let you start. And then I want to hear from Dirk as well. You know, Fred went through a lot of coaching change over the past year or two, right? We saw that, you know, he moved on from Matt Abdelmassi, who was his right hand guy through and through his, his really main recruiter. I think Fred has taken on more of a kind of direct operation within the recruiting side of this program. You have to give him a ton of credit for making the tough changes he had to have because the assistant coaches we have on hand now, you know, Nate Lenzer and, and all that group, Adam Howard, they all do have, have changed this program. 
yeah, obviously it starts with the head man. Um, and as you mentioned, sometimes making the tough choices, you know, people that have been with you, your, your, your career and helped you with in a lot of stops, a lot of places done a lot for you, but, uh, to make changes that are necessary. Um, it's, it's hard, you know, and to see, to see the fruits of that come to fruition, um, to see the change between, you know, two, three years ago where, um, you know, the defense was more akin to Swiss cheese, but now tough gritty, this is a team that we got bigs that are ready for big 10 play can play bully ball. They're ready for it. We got guys that can guard the outside. We got guys that can shoot. We got guys that can score inside. We got a little bit of everything, as Dirk had said, and just the construction to this team. And as I said, that all starts with the the head man and, and Fred's vision. And I think this is kind of what he's been waiting for. This is probably the team most true to his vision of what he wants his basketball team to look like. Blake, I I am not overstating this when I say that Fred Hoiberg absolutely deserved to be fired two years ago. Uh, and And, and – you know, the fact that this has worked out the way that it has, I don't think it disproves the fact that he deserved to be fired. I think it, it you know, proves the fact that uh, sometimes people change and sometimes um, people, you know, can, can derail and get back on track. And I think that's the great story here. Uh, this program was in a dark, dark place two, three years ago, uh, darker than, frankly, any moment in 60 years of Nebraska basketball. And, and Hoiberg found a way. I mean, he, I think, you know, the staff changes were a critical piece of it. I think he finally got lucky on a couple guys, uh, which, you know, I don't mean to take credit away from him. I'm just saying sometimes you need a little bit of good fortune. And I think he got it. Um, it just a huge, you know, huge tip of the hat to him because I thought, uh, I didn't think there was any way that Nebraska basketball was going to rebound after what we saw two, three years ago. And, and it's great to see, you know, kind of the the Fred Hoiberg that was promised five or six years ago. Uh, when Nebraska hired him, I was super, super excited. And uh, I'm super, super excited now because it, it does feel like he's sort of found a new template. Tyler Worrell says, I'm so happy for this team. It was a program-defining win. Scotty MC 33 says, I'm just crying in my living room. Uh, Jason Palmer says energy from the jump was way better than in Madison. The effort was fun to watch. Gary missed three free throws and nobody else missed. That's how you beat top teams and 60% shooting from three obviously helps too. And then Caleb Badura says probably way too early, but is this the, the best Nebraska ball team ever? Now, obviously Dirk, you know, we've been a three seed in the past, things like that, but I want to shift that question a little bit. What do you see out of this team that might compare positively and negatively to the, some of the things that those Danny Knee great teams in the late 90s had? Well, basketball has changed so much in 30 years. Um, you know, I think it, in some ways you, you barely recognize it. Uh, but, but Nebraska, when they're good, they spread the floor uh, about as well as any, you know, Husker team, any good Husker team that we've seen. I mean, there was a Drevo, Conklin, Cohorn team in there that spread the floor, but they didn't, you know, they didn't necessarily do much else. Uh, this team does a does a really nice job, I think, offensively of of you know running stuff that that puts defenses in tough spots. And they've got shooters. Um, you know, they've got you know Bryce Williams is a really key component in terms of kind of breaking down a defense. Um, you know, it's probably a little bit too early to tell on some of this, but but I do love the offensive versatility. And again, I look back at that team from ten years ago that went to the NCAA tournament. And they were tough-minded. Uh, they were, you know, pretty long and athletic. But, man, they just – even when they were good, they were dribbling the ball a lot. It was a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff. You know, they didn't shoot it very well. This team just has more ways to beat you offensively. And, and we'll see if they continue to develop. But that part of it is really encouraging because, again, it just gives you more – uh, more more outs or more, you know, a larger margin for error. And uh, I think that's what, you know, that's what all the good teams have. They have multiple ways to beat you. Then rounding it out, Chicago Station says, ah, in all caps. Uh, Logan Baker says, proud. These boys knows how, to, knows how, these boys know how to fight. Hashtag GBR. 
AK47 uh, Media, Alex Kidwell says, took my shirt off, twisted it around my head, and spun it around my head like a helicopter. Best Husker sports moment since I started school back in 2012. Just want to soak this in. They're ready to beat Iowa and keep striking while the iron is hot. And uh, rounding it out, Jacob Wright says, Wilcher is playing the best ball of his career. Hoiberg needs to be the sixth man. Everyone has hit a big-time shot. The biggest was the Alec corner three right before the under-12 to start a run. Minnesota second half may have been the best thing for us, and PBA was electric. And, Mike, how big of, of a, an influence, in your opinion, was uh, PBA's crowd and, and everybody that showed up to support the Huskers today despite the, the poor weather? Oh, it's it's massive. I think I saw a stat <clears throat> this morning that Big Ten teams are like six and twenty-two in conference. It's it's t- it's hard to win on the road, and a lot of that goes, you know, just the travel is tough. But when you have an environment like PBA, when it gets rocking, when it's packed, I it's it's a tough place to play, especially when you know everybody's everybody's hoping for one big thing to happen like that. And everybody's together. It's, it's easy, you know, when the number one team comes to town, uh, like I said, I don't know the last time an environment, maybe no sit Sunday or something like that, where the whole crowd knows kind of what's on the line, what's available, what's there for the taking. Um, and kind of is, is as we won. Um, you know, it's, it was loud listening to it on TV. Seemed like, you know, sometimes when you go to a game, you'll go on a little run, a little five Oh run for the Huskers and not, a lot of people get up and cheer and it's just kind of, you know, a, a handful, but it seems like after every big shot, every three, you know, a steal or anything like that, the crowd was getting into it. Um, and I, it's, it's amazing to see what the fans bring and, and how, how hungry, hungry this fan base is for, for something to happen. So that'll round out pretty much everybody. I think I got to just about everybody that responded. want to thank everybody again for uh, tweeting in their thoughts to the game. If you want to be on the next episode, make sure you respond to the Huskers fans. What are your reactions to it that we post after every single game for a chance to be featured on the show? And finally, I want to uh, congratulate Huskin Fanatic, who is our Big Ten win uh, sweatshirt giveaway winner for this episode. So congrats, Husky Fanatic, and we will make sure that we get you taken care of. So that being said, ra- let's round out that side of it. And let's transition into our Iowa preview. You are listening to the Scarlet Shootaround Podcast. Okay, Mike and Dirk, so Iowa here, um, pretty interesting team and excited to dive into them, the, into them. But first, Mike, we have a sponsor to share. Correct. This segment, uh, the opponent preview, is brought to you by Tax and Business Consultants. They are providing all the tax, accounting, payroll, and consulting your business needs. They partner with you to specifically tailor strategies suited to you and your business. Committed to positive positive client outcomes since 1961, they have been relieving stress related to taxes in all forms. Their offices are located in Blair, Columbus, and Lyons, so give them a call at 402-426-4144 or visit their website at www.tbc.tax. That is T as in Tominaga, B as in Bryce Williams, and C as in Coach Hoiberg.tax. Once again, that phone number is 402-426-4144. Go Big Red. So as always, I want to uh, thank everybody over at uh, Tax and Business Consultants for sponsoring us here on the Scarlet Shooter on Podcast. Let's get into Iowa, guys. They were preseason picked ninth in the Big Ten. Uh, Ken Palm has them as the 53rd overall team. Offensively, they are 23rd, and defensively, they are 122nd. Most interesting, though, guys, as typical per Fran McCaffrey, they play with the sixth fastest tempo in the country. Uh, notable wins for them. They beat number 68, Ken Palm Seton Hall on a neutral court, 85 to 72. Number 87, Rutgers at home, 86 to 77. Notable losses for the Hawkeyes include number 14, Creighton, common opponent on the road, 92 84. So playing them to a much closer uh, contest than we did at home. Uh, number 12, Wisconsin on the road, 83 to 72. And they lost to number 69, Michigan at home, 90 to 80. So Uh, Mike, what do you see in this Iowa Hawkeyes squad and and what should we expect here come Friday? Yeah, as you had mentioned, uh, typical Iowa, they're they're playing quick. You mentioned the sixth quickest pace. They have the ninth fastest average length of possession on offense. So they're getting the ball, they're running, they're they're putting it up. Uh, One thing that stands out to me, though, you know, typically sometimes when teams play with pace, they're prone to turn the ball over, but they're actually 11th in the nation in in turnover percent on offense. So they're not going to give the ball away. Um, necessarily, which is which is kind of interesting. Um, of note, when they you know when they're 
just looking for shots. They don't look for a lot of threes. They're 321st in the country and three points attempted per field goal. So it's going to be a lot of twos. You know, they score 50, nearly 57% of their points come from, come from two. So they're not going to shoot beyond the arc too much. They have a couple guys that can shoot, but they're not necessarily looking for that. And it's going to be, they're trying to get out and run. So the, the key is going to be, you know, securing rebounds um, on the defensive end. Uh, it's going to be, you know, getting back when we don't get offensive rebounds and, and limiting their opportunities to get out and run and get those quick, easy looks in transition. And Dirk, this team, obviously, as we've seen with Fran over the years, they love to run up and down, shoot very quick on offense and don't really care for a whole lot of defense. Do you think Iowa's play style will play to our advantage or disadvantage? I think Nebraska stylistically will be fine. I think the challenge is, is you know, coming off of a really, really emotional win. Uh, to me, it's, you know, you worry a little bit about their legs, Nebraska's legs. Uh, you worry a little bit about the first 10 minutes of the game. You know, I was going to be going to be super motivated based on how well Nebraska played the other night. Uh, Nebraska will have their full attention. So I think the challenge is more intangible than it is tangible Friday. Uh, I was certainly good enough to score, you know, 80, 90, 100 points if things go poorly for Nebraska. So uh, it's it's going to be a pretty stiff test. I know this is not a vintage Iowa team. Uh, they've they haven't played very well lately, but uh, but offensively, they're their their hot nights are still pretty darn good and going down a couple pieces of their roster guys it all kind of starts and ends with ben Kirky, a 6'9 senior averaging 17 6 and 2 he's shooting 58 percent from the field 33 percent from three point he's a transfer in from valparaiso he led the uh the missouri valley conference in scoring he was a first team uh missouri valley player and he was the leading scorer in that league a year ago what can we expect to see out of him mike yeah, he's he's going to kind of pound the rock inside. He doesn't shoot a lot of threes, as I had mentioned. That's not really what they're looking for. He's shooting 33% from, from beyond the arc, but that's only on nine attempts. So um, he's going to be working inside, as, as Dirk had mentioned. You know, I, I'm a little worried about legs. Mast obviously had a, had a massive game against Purdue, and that takes a lot out of you trying to, to guard Edie for, you know, 40 minutes. So uh, also of note, you know, they their Iowa's last game was, you know, s- Saturday – January 6th. So they're coming off six days of rest. Um, and we're, we got three games, which we've played a lot of games, you know, with three days in between now. Um, so, so a little worried, like Dirk said about, you know, the first 10 minutes, maybe coming out flat, they got to get out to a quick start. Um, and, and I think defending the paint, obviously against Kriki is, is a big part of that. A couple other big pieces on this roster. Tony Perkins, a 6'4 senior, averaging 14, 4, and 4, shooting 45% from the field, 38% from deep. He has 26 assists over his last five games, and he scored 25 points on the road at Wisconsin. He was an honorable mention guy in the Big Ten uh, last year. So obviously a point guard that can make some plays, passing the ball really well as of late, and can score uh, when called on. Another guy to watch out for, uh, you know, been there a while. Patrick McCaffrey, a 6'9", senior, averaging 10, 3, and 2, 42% from the field, 28% three-point shooter. He's not their first offensive option, but is a wily veteran, and he kind of knows how to work his way around the league. And then at the five spot, very interestingly enough, they're starting a freshman, Owen Freeman, a 6'10", freshman, uh, averaging 10, 6, and 1. He's shooting 63% from the field, has not made a three-pointer in his two attempts yet this year. He's a good player as a freshman. I expect him to develop well in that uh, in that program. Um, and he scored double digits in four of his last five games, so maybe picking it up a little bit. But the biggest thing I took away from this team, Dirk, is that they're not as deep as the Huskers might be. They don't seem to go too deep into their bench, and, and when they do, they're not really threats. Um, do you think the Huskers' depth could play to a little bit of, of, uh, of an advantage here? Perhaps. Uh, Nebraska is not, you know, what I would consider deep, but I think that, uh, like I said earlier, Nebraska has different ways that they can beat you. Uh, and I think that that's potentially valuable in a game like this. Um, you know, I think the Huskers are a more physical team. Uh, they can take advantage of that part of it. And, you know, Tomonaga's on a heater, guys. Wilcher's on a heater. I mean, those guys, uh, I'd be surprised if, if, uh, if the two of them don't hit you know, at least five or six threes between the two of them. So um, Nebraska is is in a good place offensively right now. And I would expect that to continue. The concern that I would, I would have is just defense. You know, can they bring the same edge that they brought the other night against a team that is a very, very different style than, than Purdue. And the Hawkeyes, you know, you mentioned the Huskers on defense. 
The Hawkeyes on defense don't defend very well. You know, as again, typical Fran McCaffrey, they're 262nd in three point defense and they're 135th in two point defense, as well as being 185th in, in defensive rebounding. So, this is a team, Mike, that's willing to give up a little bit of an edge on the rebounding side of things to help transition uh, into their offense uh, quickly on the other side of things. Do you think this the Huskers will have any kind of problem with the tempo that the Hawkeyes are going to try to play at? I don't I don't really foresee a problem. You know, as I mentioned, you get they they're prone to give up, you know, quite a few threes. Um and, and as Dirk mentioned, we got a couple guys on heater. So if the shots are falling, I'm not too worried about it. I think they do a pretty good job of rebounding, and I'd imagine that the coaches are getting in their game plan and probably not going to be crashing the boards too hard. We'll probably have a couple guys leaking back to make sure to, to run in transition, not give up any easy, easy baskets. Um, the, the one worry is, you know, classic long shot, long rebound, you know, when you're shooting from 28, 30 feet, whatever, if you're hitting iron, there's a, there's a good chance that it might ricochet pretty far out and a guard grabs the board and can start running for him. So there's always a worry there, obviously, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not too generally concerned about it. You know, I think we'll probably have an edge on the glass. Um, I think we'll do probably good enough job in transition uh, to, to hold them in check and, and make them actually go into a half court offense, which isn't necessarily where they want to be. Then the last piece that we didn't really touch on is Peyton Sanford, who's a 6'7 junior, averaging 14, 7, and 3. So their best rebounder of the group, shooting 47% from the field and 40% from three, so a perimeter threat as well. Shooting 87% from the strike, so don't not a guy that we want to foul on. He was the Big Ten sixth man of the year last year. Uh, and he had a stat line of 24, 8, and 3 this year against Rutgers. So another guy that could pose a potential threat. But guys, Ken Palm projects an 84 to 83 Iowa win. Bart Torvik projecting an 85, 84 Iowa win. So we'll theoretically put this one at Iowa minus one. Dirk, where do you uh, feel on this game? Oh, boy, don't set me up for this. I mean, this is this is where, you know, your eyes are betting against your head or your heart's betting against your head. Um, I think Nebraska's playing well enough to win, but I think it's really tough for a program that's – that's not necessarily used to success to come off of a, a performance like the other night to go on the road. Um, you know, I, I think my head is telling me Nebraska stumbles and, and takes a step back. So, uh, like I said, I think they got to get one of the next two. And I think Rutgers is more likely to be that one. Mike, what about you? Where are you feeling on Iowa minus one? Yeah, I really, I really couldn't have said it better myself. You know, your heart says that they're going to keep it rolling, but as I had said, Coming into today, you know, road teams are six and twenty-two in the Big Ten. It's not easy to win on the road generally. I think you know it's typically about seventy percent of the time a home team wins. So it's tough. It's tough. Obviously, we're we're looking for our big or our first um, Big Ten road win. Obviously, had the meltdown with with Minnesota. So it's it's a tough ask. I I want to say the Huskers will pull it out though. I think they'll get the, get an edge, and I think. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the season, it feels like we've squashed our free throw shooting bugaboo. This is a pretty good free throw shooting team. And I think that might come into play here. I'll, I'll take the Huskers winning by about three, maybe like an 80 to 83 to 80 final. Uh, going to come down to free throws at the end. I'm gonna, actually going to take Nebraska plus one as well in this one. I think the offense has been nuclear the last two games. You know, you'd rather it be well than not well. And I think, uh, I, th I think they've really found something in both their spacing, their offense, and a little bit of their flow. Iowa does not defend the three well or really at all. So I think that tends to give Nebraska a little bit of advantage when Iowa wants to try to work it inside. You know, their two-point distribution, uh, very high. Um, I believe the 56.8%, I think I've written down, of their total points come from inside the arc. So, you know, it goes without saying a three is more than two, and Nebraska has been hitting a lot of their threes lately. And then finally, I don't think, again – that Iowa is as deep with their scoring threats as they have been in the past. I think their bench is a little bit short on scores. They don't have a ton of guys that scare you from three. You know, Peyton Sanford being uh, the main one, along with Perkins, both shooting a 38% or higher from beyond the arc. But I don't think Iowa has the firepower that they've had in the, fa in the past. I think they still are going to run offensively the style that they have, but I just don't think they have the pieces to make it work like, like they have um, in years prior. So I'm going to take Nebraska here to continue on the momentum and win this one 84 to 82. So that'll wrap up our Iowa preview. We'll catch you on, their, on, on the other side and get you out of here. You are listening to the Scarlet Shootaround Podcast. So thank you guys again for listening to the Scarlet Shooter on podcast. Um, 
we tried Twitter Spaces for the last uh, Purdue game live the night of. Uh, I think it worked okay. The mic quality obviously wasn't very good because of having to use my phone for it and things like that. But worked pretty well, so we're open to doing it again. Obviously, you know, due to scheduling conflicts, Mike wasn't able to attend. But I think there's some potential there if we have some big wins down the road. So we'll keep that open. Um, you know, Dirk, what would you say – would be your projection for the Huskers as we continue on through the season. What what do you think is going to happen here if you had to put a label on it? Well, it it feels to me a little bit like the 2018 season um, where Nebraska, you know, frankly took advantage of a fairly weak Big Ten. Um, you know, I think this team is is offensively better than that team, but but it strikes me as a team that – that is going to be good enough to be, you know, fifth or sixth in the Big Ten uh, if they can stay healthy. And that's always a big asterisk. You know, Nebraska's health over the years has, you know, has been a concern. Um, you know, they <laughs> still having Isaac Copeland flashbacks. You know, there's – there's uh, they can't afford a big injury. Um, and so – but if they stay healthy, I think they're good enough to be a uh, you know fifth place in the Big Ten, something like that, and and that I think gets them into that nine or ten seed in the NCAA tournament. So um, I I can't believe I'm saying this, but I actually think Nebraska is an NCAA tournament team. <laughs> Mike, what about you? Have your expectations changed at all after that Purdue game? Yeah, I think it's with a big win like that, it's pretty easy for your expectations to change. Um, I I have them, you know, earlier in the preview, I think I had them in the eight through 10 spot, probably in the big 10, but now, yeah, I don't see how they couldn't finish, you know, five, six, seven, somewhere around there, hopefully above seven, but five, six, seven, somewhere around that area, um, maybe make something happen in the big 10 tourney and then hopefully not have to sweat too much selection Sunday. My heart uh, couldn't really take it. Even though the game was kind of out of hand in the second half, I must be having, you know, flashbacks or, you know, Stockholm syndrome or something about just worrying about how Nebraska is going to lose this one uh, last night. So for my heart's sake, I hope uh, I don't have to worry about too much come selection Sunday. But uh, yeah, I think this is, they definitely have the talent to be a tournament team. They just got to take it one game at a time and, and take care of business. And guys, I think for me personally, I don't think the expectations have changed. I think the expectation is still to find a way to get into the tournament, whatever seed that may be. But I think what it has done is changed the ceiling of this team. I think now that all of a sudden with that first opening stretch here in the Big Ten going three and two with with a couple big wins, Michigan State at home and, and Purdue at home, both being quad ones as we speak today, I think the ceiling of this team has now all of a sudden morphed into a potential top four, as Dirk mentioned earlier, top four team in the Big Ten that can get the double bye. I think, you know, if you're just looking at the Big Ten in general, I think obviously – you know, last night result notwithstanding, Purdue is going to have a better conference record than us for sure. I would anticipate Illinois having a better conference record than us. But outside of that, you know, Wisconsin, I assume will have a better record than us. I think there's still a little bit to be out there with them and seeing how they finish. But that fourth spot is up for grabs amongst the Northwesterns, the Ohio States, the Nebraskas. And I can't believe I'm even saying it, but potentially even the Minnesotas of the world. So I think before the season started, we were talking about, okay, well, if you can somehow backdoor your way into eighth place in the Big Ten, get a big win or two, go 10 and 10 in conference, I think you have a shot. But now I'm starting to think that if everything goes right, guys, Nebraska could finish 13 and 7 in the Big Ten and be staring right down the gun barrel of, of getting fourth place in the Big Ten. Dirk, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think it's out there. Um, you know, most years in the Big Ten, you know, I think this Nebraska team would slot a little bit lower. Uh, but I think, I think the Huskers have a chance, you know, it's, I will say though, you gotta be careful because it, it is, it's a program that's not used to prosperity and, um, managing, managing those emotions and expectations is a lot different than, than playing the underdog all the time. Uh, Nebraska is, if they keep playing well a month from now, you know, they're not going to sneak up on anybody. And that, that makes for a tougher, a tougher road than, uh, than when you're a seven point underdog every night. Mike, what do you see a potential four seed in Nebraska's future? If everything goes right. I mean, if you're, if you're going to say, if everything goes right, obviously, yeah, if everything goes right, they're going to go two and two in their next two games and take care of business on the road and then come back home and continue to take care of business. You know, we have a couple opportunities maybe for some quad one wins out there still obviously going to have Wisconsin coming to PBA 
Um, if they can get that win, it's another massive win for the resume and, and obviously in the conference. So if they do everything right and everything goes beautifully and even better than expected, yeah, they could absolutely be the four. Um, I'm not going to say it's probably going to happen. It's definitely up for grabs, though, but um, I'll probably be happy if they end up winning the five or six spot personally. So I think that about wraps up all of our thoughts on this one. I um, want to thank you guys again to uh, for listening into the Scarlet Shoot Round podcast. Make sure you follow us on Apple and Spotify to make sure you never miss an episode that we release. We try to release after every game so far, so good. And hopefully we can keep that up. A little bit difficult with all my traveling all of a sudden, but we're still finding a way to make this happen. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at Scarlet Shoot Pod for opportunities to be included in the uh, in the podcast itself with your responses. We live tweet during the games. We tweet any tournament updates, net updates, metric updates, and anything related to Nebraska basketball that we feel necessary to share. And then finally on Instagram, at Scarlet Shoot Pod as well, and YouTube, which Mike does a great job uploading all the video podcasts a day after uh, they release live on Apple and Spotify. So uh, I think we're up to 20 or 25 subscribers there, some along those lines. So if you prefer video podcasts, make sure you tune in over there. So outside of that, I want to thank you. Thank you again, Dirk. Do you have any parting thoughts before we get out of here? I can't believe you thought this was only going to take 15 minutes. What were you? <laughs> what were you? <laughs> we beat the number one team in the country, and you thought we were going to get out of here in 15 minutes? <laughs> A lot more to talk to talk about than I guess I had anticipated, but that's how this thing usually goes. We usually sp- signal it right in at about 39 minutes in general, but we ended up talking. This is what we do. But when we win, we want to talk, right? It's a lot easier to talk when you win by 16 than when you get blown out by 16. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. So thank you again, everybody, for listening. In. Go Big Red, baby.